Hello and welcome to this edition of the Boomer Beat with yours truly, Beverly Mahone. And today we are talking about Black college sports. That's right, because you know, I know a little something something about sports. But the person who knows more than me and more than most people is joining me today. I am pleased to welcome my good friend and former college instructor. Yes, can you believe that? He was my former college instructor at Ohio University and he used to crack that whip. All right, he is now the managing partner of the Onadan Group, Mr. Eric Moore. Hey, Eric, welcome to the show. I can call you Eric now, yes, can yes, I? Yes, you can do that now since we are uh, equals in terms of, uh, although my screen may be a little larger than yours, but anyway. <laughs> yes, feel free because I know that makes it. In fact, it's funny that you bring that up. Uh, I've been doing some interacting with um, some students at my alma mater, which is NC State University. And we were brought up here in the South. I'm a native Southerner, born and raised in Durham, North Carolina, love it to death, wouldn't um, deny it at all because of all of the experiences it, it gave me. But there are, uh, there are Southern methods of young people interacting with older people without being disrespectful. And in many instances, and I saw some of this when some of the teachers were getting ready to open up the classroom so that the uh, students could return. And they would actually put their name up like Miss Vicky, as opposed to Miss Jones. Uh, and often when you run into properly instructed Southern young people, uh, out of respect, they will go like you would become Miss Beverly. And I'm going yes. to be Mr. Eric. So, uh, but in this particular situation, since I consider us to be professional colleagues, you may call me whatever you feel most comfortable doing. Okay, very good. And you know, I have to share this with you, and I don't even know if you remember this, but I remember um, I had you for radio and television, uh, radio television class. Mm -hmm. And I remember when you introduced yourself to the class, you said that you were from North Carolina. And you said that you, uh, I guess most people knew of UNC Chapel Hill, but mm -hmm. then you said, if you can't go to college, you go to state. And I have <laughs> never forgotten that. And I was like, I didn't really understand what that meant at the time, yes, of course. Right. You know, I really yeah. didn't have any association with the South. But when I got here, I kind of got it because everybody, <laughs> you know, UNC yep. is so popular, et cetera, Correct. et cetera. But, Anyway, who would have thought that, you know, 40 years later, we would become, you know, coming back full circle again and reconnecting. It's, it's a small world. Thanks to Zoom. Okay, so let's just talk about Black college sports. Sure, sure. What is the state of Black college sports today in your professional opinion? Good question. I have thought about that when we were kind of thinking through how would we make ourselves a resource for those around. And, and the teacher in me obviously wants to go back and do some groundwork laying. But generally speaking, and, and we kind of talked about it just before we went on the air, the state of black college sports is, and I would put it tenuous, it's almost like President Trump's chances of getting reelected. And, and I say that simply because he's out trying the best he can to shore up his base. And many uh, HBCUs who have been trying to historically black colleges and universities. You may also hear me say HWCUs as a way of distinguishing historically black colleges from historically white colleges. Because in effect, um, there are two different purposes behind the beginning of those schools. You know, Notre Dame was not started to uh, educate black folk. Uh, Notre Dame was started to educate Catholics. And a lot of times there's some backstories that go with all of this. Let me go back to the UNC right quick. Uh, those of us who didn't have the pleasure of attending the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill also recognized, just observing, that it had the only, for a long period of time, journalism school in the state. So there are a lot of people in our business who were trained in Chapel Hill. And in some cases, many of them have that allegiance to Chapel Hill and sometimes aren't quite as, um, shall we say, un- 
initiated or impartial as perhaps they should be in the journalistic realm. So the whole, you know, you can go to, uh, go to UNC Chapel Hill or go to state. And then <laughs> I've run into other situations where I began to interact with people and um, they get very serious about the uh, camaraderie or shall I say, they get very serious about the competition between the two schools. And there's a key difference historically between uh, HWCU's um, historically white colleges and universities uh, and historically black colleges and universities after the competition. Um, theoretically, you play hard uh, and it's over. Sometimes you'll see it if you're watching some of the pro games that some of the players will come and find perhaps former teammates or others just to give them a big hug, game's over, let's go out for dinner or whatever we want to do. Uh, I have been to ACC basketball tournaments where ticket holders would be in the parking lot trying to sell their tickets if, they team, if their team lost. Uh, because they, as far as they were concerned, there was no more tournament left because their team did not win. Uh, HBCUs have a much larger culture. In fact, BET uh, has just put together a, a um, feature, I caught it the other night, regarding homecomings uh, at yes. uh, HBCUs. And uh, they had a large and diverse group of HBCU alums talk about what did they like about homecoming. And it went from food to camaraderie, seeing some old classmates. Uh, and so what happens is in many instances, and band members will love to remind you, some folk will come to the game to actually watch football, where other people come to the game to hook up with their friends. Uh, all of that contributes to the culture that is HBCUs. And right now, the uh, uh, COVID-19 and all of the unexpected, unanticipated costs associated with it are having an interesting impact on historically black college and university sports. Uh, Let me ask you a question about that. Okay. And I'm glad you brought that up because that was going to be something I wanted to um, discuss. But since you've opened up that door, let's walk through it. Okay. So you know that the ACC, the Big Ten, the Big 12, you know, they initially thought about it, weren't sure, but now they are in full, moving full steam ahead. But the HBCU said, you know, no, we really need to be precautious about this. So we're not going to do it. Was that the best move for them? You know, knowing that the revenue is something that they rely on. I mean, in hind I mean, hindsight's always 2020 yeah, yeah, now. Yeah. What do you think? Well, Mr. Cookman is a classic example of someone who thought through the whole process. Their athletic director is nationally recognized as just top flight people. His name is Lynn Thompson. And he actually holds the position of vice president. So he reports directly to the president. And he's, he's sitting in on the meetings when they're talking about this. The key focus of an HBCU has always been the student. The main reason HBCUs got started was because uh, black folk couldn't go to um, non-HBCUs. They just right. weren't admitted. And so their purpose has been to educate. Uh, athletics just happens to be a part of the culture. Uh, and for many of them, it came down to money. In fact, I always find it interesting that Wake Forest University, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, has been often described as a big school because they're in the ACC. But their enrollment is less than North Carolina A&T. Yet A&T is a small school and Wake Forest is a big school. A lot of it has to do with the perceptions of the people making the reports. And so once you kind of go and filter through some of those reports, you begin to see, okay, this is your priority, but that isn't necessarily your audience's priority or a general view of the situation. So yes, it was just a purely financial situation that all of a sudden the Big Ten decided we weren't going to play. And then uh, the president got involved. Uh, yes, the Big Ten should play. And then I'm sure some phone calls were made. You know, if you guys play, we could buy advertising and sponsorship, and that would be a revenue stream to replace the fact that you won't have fans in the stands. So HBCUs have never had that option. Too many people are often looking for the hookup. Uh, if I can get into the game free and see my friends, I'm happy, as opposed to paying for a ticket. And it's been a historical problem with HBCUs getting its alumni, uh, getting uh, the former students and others who may have an affiliation with the school to just make a donation. Now, one of the good things that's coming up after all of the 
pandemic stuff that's going on is that schools are now focusing much more heavily, HBCUs there is, all schools, but HBCUs specifically, are focusing much more heavily on getting donations. You know, we're not all as poor as some would profess that we are. And so there is some money out there. And as a result of that money being out there, it's now a chance for the schools to go and pitch themselves as a place where you could send that money. Um, so the, the key is that the HBCUs are, and the, the, if you ever get to talk to some of the top administrators, they'll say it's not our decision, it's the um, uh, virus's decision. Whatever the virus decides to do, we're going to have to react to it. And so in many instances, Bethune Cookman being the primary case, another one is um, Florida Atlantic, I'm sorry, Florida Memorial uh, University down in Miami Beach uh, has also shut down spring sports. There are a lot of schools who are sitting on basketball schedules and have not released them yet because who knows what's going to happen? I mean, I just heard today that a quarterback from Clemson University has been tested positive for the coronavirus. He won't be playing into Saturday's game. Well, okay, the second string quarterback who has already got the chance to play when they're running up the score with everybody is going to start. And then um, Lawrence will be able to perhaps be free to go. And the president who has the top doctors in the world taking care of him so he can go into the hospital and come out. Everybody doesn't have that, that kind of connection to those kinds of resources, especially HBCUs. Now, fortunately, there are some experts in the line. Uh, Howard University's president, for instance, is a medical doctor. And because of that, he can look at it from the medical standpoint. Uh, they have not made an announcement about what they're going to do. But uh, strategically placed people who are listened to uh, can make an impact in terms of the decision making. Okay, so you mentioned a um, couple of things here. Okay. Uh, let's go back to A&T. Right. Now, you know, A&T moved out of the MEAC conference. Yes. And they are now, well, I want to say kind of like, sort of like the big dogs, not really the big, big dogs, <laughs> but the bigger dogs. Yes, yes. Um, so it, was that a good move for them, do you think? You know, that's a very good question. Um, there are some who want to keep holding on to that tradition of HBCUs. And I don't know if moving to the Big South Conference as a and has done uh, after Hampton had done it last year, was necessarily a move up. It could have been more of a lateral move and an opportunity for them to expose themselves to a different audience that may contribute to the university's growth. Um, for them, and, and I always will say, okay, you get paid a significantly more money than I do to make these decisions. Uh, I think they felt um, it was a good move for them because it expanded their um, mode of influence. They have played schools in that conference before. In fact, I've done some work at Gardner Webb University, which is um, in Boiling Springs, North Carolina. A wonderful trip if you're going past Charlotte, take US Highway 74, and then you go into Mountain S area, and lo and behold, boom, university. <laughs> uh, so many, many of the schools that we knew about that may have been, you know, back in the cut. Uh, are also similarly configured um, in other conferences. Uh, and from a sure, uh, another problem that the MEAC is going to be facing down the road has to do with travel. You know, if I'm in Daytona Beach, Florida, for instance, at Bethune Cookman University, and I've got a softball game in Dover, Delaware, at um, Delaware State, uh, that's going to be a long trip. And that long trip is going to have some impact on me, like I'm supposed to be sitting in the back of the bus studying for my next test. Uh, so the travel reduction was one of the attractions for A&T because most of the schools in the Big South Conference are within North Carolina, um, South Carolina, and are easily reached um, by bus. Uh, it could be an overnight trip, or it could be uh, you go to the game, play the game, get on the bus and come on back. So that was a benefit in terms of A&T. I'm not going to be spending as much money for travel. My students won't be out of class as long as they may have been for some of these MEAC trips. And like I said, they're going to expose themselves to a new and different audience. And it'll be interesting to see how that develops. Do you think that'll help their, their recruiting efforts any more than um, it would have had they stayed in the MEAC? There are always going to be people 
exposed differently to a different school than the one that perhaps they're used to. Uh, they are one of the largest HBCUs in the country. They have an engineering program. They are geared towards STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. So they could easily, and, and they've been a thrust in the North Carolina system, University of North Carolina system, to um, diverse, uh, diversify the um, student body. So I think, yeah, that, they're going to get some benefits out of it. Uh, from an athletic standpoint, they're going to be looking for large, chunky linemen for the football team, uh, which tend to be um, gentlemen that don't look like you or me. So from that standpoint, uh, I think they're going to get some benefits out of it. a and is a good school. They've got a good reputation. They have had some national recognition. Of course, they won the Celebration Bowl out of the MEAC. Uh, and again, we're dealing with perception. I know you've heard me say no such thing as reality, only an individual's perception of what is taking place. And as long as the perception is that they are on the uh, uprise or uh, growing and getting bigger and better, then there's a possibility they're going to benefit from this particular move. And then we'll see what happens down the road. Okay, speaking of recruiting, um, earlier this year or late last year, uh, the number one high school recruit in the country decided that he was going to attend an HBCU, much to I mean, I was totally shocked. I, told, I, I expected him to go to Duke or Kentucky. That's yep. where I expected. Yep. But then he announced that he was going to Howard University. Now, I have two questions. Was that really a smart move on his part? And number two, do you see more of a trend of the top Black athletes moving towards HBCUs? Why or why not? Ooh, just, just... Throw me the easy question. You know, just I'll take this off balls anytime. <laughs> well, you're the expert. <laughs> I'm asking you because I want to know what you think. I don't think a lot of us realize how impactful the George Floyd live on television practically killing impacted a lot of people. Uh, there are a lot of people who did not understand that these kinds of things were going on until they got to see it with their own eyes. That has also had an impact on athletes because having gone to a historically white college, uh, it can beat up on your psyche when you're dealing with negatives. <laughs> In fact, my daughter and I uh, have talked about how uh, on the, the, the NC State campus, if you walk by a certain dorm, you could get called certain names. And if you look to see where it was coming from, the dorm was so far away, you couldn't really you know, get over there in time. And of course, by the time they saw you coming, they'd hide and everything would, would uh, be, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, some athletes begin to understand that just because I'm on the team at the particular school and get treated a certain way doesn't mean I'm being respected. And so they're beginning to realize that they have a little more influence and power than perhaps they were giving themselves credit for. Uh, for McCord to make the move to Howard, which is a prestigious HBCU, as some will call it part of the Black Ivy League, but you're there at the nation's capital, you're bringing a lot of attention to the school, um, I've had situations where there are students that, uh, in the case, I taught at a CIAA school. I'm um, at the CIAA school, obviously I'm a sports fan. So I happen to ask the students, you know, who are we playing in an upcoming athletic contest? They didn't even know the other schools that were in the conference. So of course I turned that around into a um, speech to inform. So you're, you're going to inform your classmates about one of the schools that's in the conference, or go do your research, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, there are still a lot of people that don't know what HBCUs are, don't know why they existed. And so the George Floyd situation, uh, as well as the Breonna Taylor situation, say their names and all of the protests that went with that, I think are opening some people's eyes to the point that athletes are saying, why should I go to this college and make all of this money for the head coach and not necessarily get any benefits myself? So maybe if I can go to a place where I can enjoy myself and where, yes, I may be an athlete, but I don't necessarily stay in a separate dorm. Uh, I stay in the same area as other students so I can interact with other students uh, and be a lot more normal than the superstar that many of them are professed to be. But Howard isn't one of your, yeah, it's the elite of the elite in the HBCU realm, but it isn't 
elite when it comes to basketball programs. I mean, Agreed. I really would have thought that he might have considered North Carolina Central with, you know, Lavelle Moton there, who's had how many back-to-back-to-back to back to back, uh, yeah, championships? The interesting so, thing is, <laughs> no, I see, I see your point. And, and it's not going to happen overnight. But if he comes and there's talk about others of similar skills coming, and all of a sudden Howard wins the MEAC, then they've got immediately entry into the uh, NCAA tournament. They get to the NCAA tournament and show their stuff on television because all of the games are going to be televised. Then that may, in effect, begin to have an impact on the school itself and its success. I mean, we are still talking about Norfolk State beating the number two seed uh, back when um, uh, can't his last name. Or, 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 or Corin is his is, is his last name. Until um, he was, um, the, the, and Hampton comes right behind me. <laughs> and I've heard the stories that Hampton went to the uh, NCAA playoffs. That they were so enamored with the cheerleaders that they invite the cheerleaders to come to the <laughs> local hockey game just to cheer because it was a totally different perspective. You know, and you've been to both events, and you know it's got just a whole different style. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And that's, yes. that's part of the HBCU experience. Yes. And so there are people who really enjoy that, look forward to it, uh, as well as going to um, the game and watching the band. <laughs> In fact, it took me a while to understand. I went to the, um, uh, it was called the State Fair, State Fair Classic, uh, uh, Prairie View A&M and Grambling State. They play every year uh, in conjunction with the Texas State Fair, play it in the Cotton Bowl. So I was there working with um, television network. And so I'm there and um, everybody's there, of course, getting all psyched up. And this is when Prairie View wasn't very good. And so Prairie View's getting beat up and the Grambling's maybe up by two or three touchdowns at halftime. All of a sudden the place empties. And so the SID, Sports Information Director, looked at me and said, hey, don't worry, uh, they just know that after halftime, I might as well just go into the fair because we know what the results of the game is going to be. <laughs> and sure enough, uh, right after the band, <laughs> Grambling's band played, Prairie View's band played, and then half the stadium empty because they were going to go on to the state fair. That was the other reason for being in town. And the state fair knew that, so they made it very easy for them to have their game in the Cotton Bowl and then just walk out the gate and head on into the state fair. Uh, to the point that they actually had an extra game um, with um, Southern and I think Prairie View uh, also at the Cotton Bowl because they recognize if once I got your tickets and you paid to come into the game, you know, that's revenue for me uh, that may or may not always go to the schools. So, uh, yes, they will not be world beaters overnight. It's going to take a while for them to be significantly competitive, but for the fact to even think about it, and to have other people say, well, you know, if he goes, and we've seen it in some cases in the NBA, when LeBron <laughs> literally recruited uh, most of the players for the Lakers, and what do they have? An NBA title for the Lakers. So uh, it, it can happen in a variety of matters and in a variety of ways. Um, so, yes, Howard's not going to be a world beater overnight. They still got to be Central. They still got to be some other schools. But um, uh, <laughs> it, right. it, it should make for a higher quality of play and uh, hopefully uh, attract more people to the HBC. Oh, I didn't even know these schools were here and they are. Let's talk about prime time Ooh, going yeah. to Jackson State. Now, okay, so the, the, the previous coach got fired in June. Yes. And then they announced shortly thereafter that Deion Sanders was going to be the new football coach. Then a couple of months after that, which was not that long ago, like last week or the week before, they announced some sanctions against Jackson State, and they are now on probation. My first question is, will he make a difference? Yes, he already has. Has he really? Yes, he already has. Now, of course, the ultimate test is going to be how many games he wins and will his team actually be competitive in the Eastern division of the Southwestern athletic conference, but his connections, in fact, I laugh because he's uh, promoting a certain food product and appears on that food product. 
Jackson State had signed an agreement for apparel, et cetera, with Nike. Well, it just so turns out that Coach Prime, as he likes to call himself, uh, is a Reebok representative. Well, now they worked it out. Everything is negotiable. So now Jackson State is a Reebok. Um, no, I'm sorry, Under Armour. I said Reebok. Oops, excuse me. Yeah, he's an well, Under Armour. Yeah, now they might have to pay for that. Your mention on <laughs> on my show. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't it be nice if we could get some of those perks? It would. A lot of people are like, oh, look at that Ford sitting over there. Oh, look at that Chevrolet, not knowing that Chevrolet and Ford paid for the privilege to be the only vehicle that the FBI is driving around when they're catching people. Anyway, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, um, um, Dion has made a difference. In fact, um, he's still putting his staff together. But the connections that he has and the fact that he wanted to coach, the other little caveat is that he was not a candidate for the head coaching job at Jackson State until he became a graduate of Tougaloo College. And in many instances, part of the strategy for HBCU staffing for athletics is that not only do you coach, but you may teach a class, you may be a dorm director. They give you a second job so then they can put the two together and you will tend to get a reasonable salary as a result of that. Well, it's going to be tough in a college environment, and I know you've run into it. If you don't have an advanced degree, you can't teach children with the same degree or aspiring for the same degree that you already have. So if I want to teach people who are aspiring for a bachelor's degree, I have to at least have a master's. Well, if I'm going to be on the college campus uh, and interact with people that have bachelors, I must at least be equal to them. So the fact that Dion got his bachelor's degree from Tulu made him an even more qualified candidate because he's already said all along he wanted to coach college football. Uh, he tried to go back to his alma mater where they could have perhaps made some uh, arrangements, but I guess chose not to, uh, but he stuck to it and he's already having an impact, uh, trust me. And you'll find it out when he finishes his recruiting. He's already recruited his son. I don't know if the, the son has accepted the offer or not, but uh, he's got a big name. He's got a lot of attention, and in many instances, that's going to help contribute now. Then, of course, as things kind of settle down, we'll see if he can coach. Well, I will tell you this. Um, I follow him on Twitter, and I've been tweeting my grandson's football videos to him <laughs> like almost every week. Really and I'm is. sure he's probably like, who is this crazy woman? But <laughs> I just want him to know that, you know what, my grandson's got skills. Yeah. You, you know, might want him somewhere down the road, maybe. Very good, very good. That's how it's done. It's done all the time. And now with the uh, technology becoming more accessible, uh, like you just say, you just put together a highlight tape and send it and that can sometimes get people seen that might not normally have been taken a look at because you've got camps, of course, you've got videotape and you've got other methods of exposing good players. And there are plenty of players around. It's a matter of them deciding where they want to go. All right, so I'm going to uh, do a little round robin here before we get ready to wrap this up. Okay. Which HBCU do you believe has the best overall sports program? Ooh. Ooh. Not just football, not right, just basketball, right. but overall. Well, off the top of my head, I would say with Thelma Cookman. And I say that because their football team is always competitive. Their women's basketball team has won two straight MEAC championships. Their men's team has always been competitive. Their baseball team usually had dominated the MEAC for quite some time. Their golf team is quite good, both men and women. They've won minority titles um, for quite a while. Uh, so overall, I would, I would put Bethune-Cookman up there. Florida A&M is on the rise. They just got a new athletic director. They're doing a lot of fundraising because it, it takes money to really put these programs where they should be. Uh, fortunately, FAMU has a very nice uh, indoor facility, so it'll be attractive to um, a lot of students. Um, Jackson State's on the rise. Their athletic director, uh, Ashley Robinson, uh, who just came from Prairie View, I'm sorry, came from Arkansas Pine Bluff, uh, is also working toward expanding. They've had good baseball programs. Um, hopefully, this will be a resurgence of football. Then you've got women's basketball, men's basketball, and of course the sonic boom of the South, just for a little extra flavor, uh, should you need some entertainment. Um, there is an all sports trophy that is often given out, unfortunately, because of the timing 
with the pandemic, um, they weren't given out this year. That's also another way that you can kind of tell who is who is good and who isn't. But you know, my favorites would probably be Bethune Cookman, Jackson State, and um, possibly Howard. Howard's on its way back, but they hadn't quite got there yet. Isn't Steph Curry uh, working with their golf team? Very good, very good, Bill. <laughs> so yeah, so you see, and, and, you know, here, and that's a perfect case of, and this was a case where Steph is a golfer, uh, and some golfers at Howard knew he was a golfer, got to him and said, you know, it sure would be nice if we could get some support for our golf team, and so Steph happened, I guess, had traveling through when they were playing the Wizards, but Steph interacted with some members of the um, Howard University golf team, then took his connections and got them equipment and other support that wasn't necessarily financial. Uh, and so their golf team, yes, is about to um, come out new dibs and, and everything else based upon, again, the connection to uh, a professional athlete. Wow. And something else that um, I heard uh, Chris Paul uh, mention, uh, this is maybe about a month ago, that he was attending Winston-Salem State University to get another degree or to get his bachelor's degree, because I'm not sure if he finished at Wake Forest or not? Well, I'm not sure either. I know he was taking some classes at Winston-Salem State. He just flat out admitted his mother and father both graduated from Winston-Salem State, and he kind of wished he had gone. But he's kind of gotten the, the inspiration from when they were running the uh, uh, bubble. Uh, and he was wearing shoes of different HBCUs, depending upon um, what shoes he had and, and who they were playing that particular night. So. Again, it's a case of, and then being in Wake, in Winston-Salem, of course, he's at Wake Forest, and the Wake Forest campus is uh, accessible to Winston-Salem State campus. I'm sure he interacted with quite a few students at Winston-Salem State, and part of what he had said was, yes, I'm coming back during this off period from the um, playoffs to just take some classes on campus to kind of give him an additional feel for how things are at Winston-Salem State. So yes, uh, more and more, I think, going back to George Floyd, Many people are now beginning to take a second or third look at um, institutions, individuals, and activities that they perhaps have been ignoring in the past. I also saw too where he's doing some type of HBCU sneaker tour. Yes. Um, and has selected uh, several um, HBCUs. I didn't see NCCU on the list. I was a little oh. disappointed about that. <laughs> I can understand. Um, but uh, at least he's doing something. He's trying to he get is. it. Yes. Uh, and, and again, they begun to recognize, I say they, the athletes are beginning to recognize, they have some influence and some power. So rather than the agent coming to the athlete saying, what do you think about this? You've got the athlete now going to the agents and saying, I'd like to do this, see if you can help facilitate it. Okay, so I wanna take this last few minutes just for you to tell us about the Anna Dan group. You know, how did you come up with the concept What's the purpose behind it? How can people connect and get more information about what's going on in college sports as it relates to black athletes? Well, first of all, the name Anna Dan comes from my mother and father. I'm taking the biblical passage, Anna and our mother and our father, that the days may be longer on the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So my mother's name was Ani, my father's name was Dan, thus Ani Dan. Uh, I actually began the company because one of my specialty skills is statistics. Uh, and I've got a radio and television background, so I was able to put together, thanks to a college classmate who was working for Black Entertainment Television, uh, being able to go and work at um, athletic events for the media and provide them with statistics that they could, of course, use to write their stories. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks to my classmate who then became director of BET Sports, uh, BET regularly uh, presented the CIAA basketball tournament. And I was working at the CIAA school. He knew I did stats. And so he said, well, let's try a little experiment here. See if you can provide stats for our broadcast. And they'll just give us some additional information we can work with. So it worked pretty well for the CIAA tournament. Then I, they put me as part of the travel crew for uh, BET. They would have a skeleton crew that they would send out. And then they would hire cameramen, uh, grips and other support people locally. So I, I, will, I will never forget Jackson, Mississippi. 
Southern University versus Jackson State. Mississippi Memorial Stadium, 60,000 people, all look like me, and now they fight in the house. And the tailgating was off the chain. Uh, you kept smelling all the aromas in the stadium, but you couldn't do anything about it. Anyway, <laughs> that was when I began to realize, you know, there are a lot of people here following these teams. So I said, well, the best I could do perhaps was at least if you're in North Carolina and you're curious about how your team in Grambling is doing, I began by just reporting scores. I would get the score of the game and I had my own little method from calling the security office. Who won the game? Do you know what the score was? To checking the newspaper the next day and finding out what the scores were, publishing them to become a kind of a one-stop source for people who were interested in finding out the scores. Then thanks to a relationship with um, sports information directors who often would have stories, very good stories, they sent them to the local newspaper, the newspaper turn around and throw them in the trash. I said, well, send them to me. That can become content for my website. So That's the website right. is onidan, O-N-N-I-D-A-N.com. We also have a very active fan forum, uh, which many of my um, posters, as we call them, will come and visit and express their opinions about various topics. So between the two, the new site, onidan.com, and the fan forum, which is onidan1.com, uh, we try to cover or give other fans an opportunity to talk about what's on their mind. And, and so far, so good. We've been doing it for 33 years, uh, as well as hooking up with a guy named Lou Williams, who produces a Black College sports page. Not chicken wing, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. I had to say that. Okay. Yes, you did. <laughs> no, it's not chicken See, I know a little something, something, okay? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Uh, so uh, he does a weekly uh, newsletter uh, that he uh, sells to black newspapers so that then they can have coverage of HBCU sports in a format that works very well for them because he sends them basically a camera ready copy. All we got to do is add it, stick it in the paper and send it to their um, subscribers. So we're pro providing information to uh, other black media outlets. Uh, they're working with some people who are also covering black colleges in different parts of the country. And uh, we are now talking to each other thanks to the technology and a couple of Zoom calls. And so as a result of that, it will always be available. There's a place called HBCU Game Day who has gotten one step up because they actually have cameras. And many of the participants in the black sports media realm are either former people that used to work at stations like yourself uh, or people who came up through the ranks and were broadcast majors and didn't perhaps get the opportunity they had hoped. So they said, oh, what the heck, we'll just go on our own. So uh, thank you very much and I'll tell the world. I'm very proud of Beverly Mahone because she was an excellent student and I guess <laughs> she invited me to be on her show. Please, please be a good baby boomer and support her as best you can. <laughs> you are so funny. You were the hardest professor that I ever had. Nobody but you me. know what? You didn't I take my mess. And I guess that's <laughs> what I really appreciate about you to this day. And I also have to tell you, Bruce and I have often spoke, you know, um, maybe five, 10 years out from graduating. Bruce and mm -hmm. I, Bruce Dunn. Yes. And I always talked about you and the influence that you had on us because we had not been exposed to African American anything at oh you well at ohio university yeah, that's true. Yeah. you're right so the fact that you were there the fact that you know you were nurturing but yet tough on us to show us that you know you got to get the work done if you want to be successful correct so we have always appreciated that so well i'm, I'm glad to hear that because you never really know if you're having an impact until sometime later and you get to interact and oh yeah they'll say i remember when you said and you're trying to go did i say that yes yeah, i did okay i'm glad that i'm because i'm Bruce is another connection from Ohio University that got me into um, um, television because he also worked at BET. And so um, the training that you got, because you've got to be good, uh, it, you, you, you may get connections to get in, but you better have skills that you can use to stay there. And once the students understand that and realize that, yes, there's some people that are going to get hookups, but they're not going to stay around because they can't do the job. You've That's got right. to be able to do the work. That's right. All right. Well, on that note, I want to thank you so very much for talking to me today about the state of Black college sports. Hopefully when the season 
gets back to full speed again. We hope within the next year, uh, we'll come back and we will revisit uh, how, how Howard is doing. Have they yep. joined the ranks of the elite? And uh, will North Carolina Central University get LeBron James' son? Good Ooh. question. Very good question. Because trust me, I'm sure that Lavelle, Moulton, the head coach, has a relationship with LeBron. He does. Some of LeBron's people. So that, that, that could very well happen. Uh, and by the way, just to show you how people are anticipating the impact that McCour is going to have on Howard, he hasn't played the game, but he's on the preseason all-conference team. <laughs> what? <laughs> yes. Okay. Has not played the game, but he, the MEAC has put him, well, the coaches and SIDs have put him on the preseason all-conference team. So wow, he's probably that's destined for rookie of the year. Very, that's, that's very, very, right. <laughs> that's right. yep. very yep. impressive. So All right. Moment, yes. <laughs> that's going to do it for this edition of the Boomer Beat. Thank you so much for tuning in. And remember this, stay empowered on your journey. Take care. <laughs> okay.